These days we understand how important therapy is to maintain mental health. Therapy helps us connect the dots between our emotions, traumas and life experiences. However, in-person therapy sessions are not for everyone. They can be inconvenient, expensive, and the time between sessions can leave us feeling stranded. Thankfully, now there's Talkspace, the online talk therapy platform that's with you 24-7. Talkspace makes therapy accessible. It gives you immediate access to a licensed therapist at any time, wherever you are. And with over 5,000 licensed therapists, Talkspace will pair you with the right therapist for you, based on your needs and your budget. You have the power to start your therapy journey today and join over 1 million people who already feel happier at Talkspace.com. You'll get 24-7 access from your phone or computer to a licensed therapist that fits your needs, and you'll only pay a fraction of the price of traditional therapy. Don't forget to use promo code SILENT for $65 off your first month. That's Talkspace.com, promo code SILENT. Silent Waves contains material that may be distressing for some listeners. If any of the content is triggering for you, please refer to the support organisations in our show notes. Act 1 If you'd met me a year ago, you would never imagine me violent. The truth is, I was, often. I had a beast of rage within me that I would unleash without warning but only when alone with my partner. And you told me you wanted to kill me like so many times. You know, I was scared of you. I'd attack him. I'd claw, scream and punch until I wore myself out. And then I'd pretend it never happened. I didn't realise that I was perpetuating a cycle of abuse, one that spanned generations. Ralph got under the bed to avoid being beaten by Dad. And Dad got a broomstick and was poking and thumping it with a broomstick. I was born into a perfect family. Academic and athletic, we were all high achievers. It was like, look at how much we've done. Harry's got to be the toe, kicks it towards the goal square. Oh, he's kicked a remarkable goal! One of the goals of the year! Harry Kane has scored his But behind our facade, we were plagued by dark secrets. My family acted as an institution. As we know, institutions can provide the breeding grounds for abuse. I was asleep and I think he started like coming into my bed with me. And I was like, what the fuck are you doing? I have spent the past 18 months interviewing my family. It's the first time we have ever spoken openly about our shared history. This is my journey of breaking my silence by exposing what truly happened behind closed doors. How many crimes go unreported because they're considered family business? My name is Raquel O'Brien and this is Silent Waves. To begin this story, you need to understand how my family was established. My father, Ralph O'Brien, was a recently divorced barrister in Melbourne when he met my mother, Elizabeth. She was a witness for one of his cases. She'd recently migrated from Brazil with her two young sons, Gabrielle and Heredia. Mum had arrived on a prospective marriage visa with Heredia's father, but shortly after, He was physically violent. Suddenly single, with two kids under five and barely speaking English, mum worked tirelessly to make ends meet. Despite this, her energy was magnetic. She was beautiful and vivacious, and my dad was taken by her. September, grandfather, I think two days before, he rang and said, I would like to take you out for dinner. And then I said, oh, why not? But it was there. He was really... Would you say you were charmed? He was really him? charming. He was really, really, really um, charming. 
That was the start of their relationship, September 1989. And then in March 1990, I moved into a house in Elfin that he had. Yeah, it was a beautiful house. It was an amazing house. Within a year, they were engaged and married shortly after. I asked Uncle Brian, our closest family friend, what life was like back then. I met your mum and dad as a couple because I was married to Marcia, who was Brazilian. And, of course, your mum was Brazilian. You know, we were a big group of Brazilians and folks married to Brazilians. And that's 30 years ago or so. Do you remember if Gabriel and Heredia referred to Ralph as dad? Was that an oh, yeah. instant thing? Oh, yeah, yeah. The dynamic of their relationship was that, that he was now their father? Yeah. It seemed like mum and dad met each other at the right time. He stepped into the role of father for my brothers. They were six and four at the time. It was the beginning of what would become my family. My dad was diagnosed with testicular cancer in 1991. Because it was a rare type of cancer, the doctor said that we were not able to have children. Then I found out that I was pregnant. So it was a shock to everyone, even to the doctors. I was born in January 1993. Completed our family, and we're just so thrilled to have five of us now. But now she's here, well, there you go. <laughs> she agrees with us. A few months later, mum fell pregnant again. A fourth child was on the way. And then he said to me, look, I'm scared that cancer will come back and I don't want you staying here with four children without the support. Seeing your family in Brazil, you know, you have all the support there, your mother, your sisters, your brothers. Something happened to me. What are you going to do? My mom's not going to support you, but... You know, and I, I, in my mind too, I thought, well, if he dies, you know, how am I going to be here, you know, by myself? And I agreed. It was decided. We'd be gone in three weeks, leaving just enough time for hurried goodbyes. Firm sold, house sold, furniture packed and on a ship to Brazil. It was a very strange thing. Your mum and dad announced that they were leaving to go to Brazil without much warning. I was really taken aback. The feeling was of loss. We were losing uh, good friends, important people that were very much part of a key circle of friends. I suppose the other thing that was a bit surprising was that, I mean, it was a holeless bolus we're moving. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't a matter of, well, we're going over there for a while and see how it goes and make them back or, no, it was like we're off and uh, it was quite surprising. In January 1994, we landed in João Pessoa, a town on the east coast of Brazil. My parents were busy setting the foundations for our new life when our plans were halted due to an issue with their bank. In Brazil, the banks were notoriously unreliable. We got to João Pessoa and we had a list of the house to see. Ralph told me that he couldn't access our money. He said that we need to go back to Rio. Mum's family lived in Rio de Janeiro. We had a support system there. We stayed in a hotel while Dad was getting to the crux of the money issue. Uh, I'm going in now for an interview with Elizabeth. Uh, Donna Elizabeth, what's the water like? Uh, this is Ralph O'Brien reporting from Harpin Pippi. Three weeks on, Mum's father called. Say, have you seen the newspapers? And then I said, no, why? There is a lot being said about you and Emra Half. I said, what? I said, yeah, you're front page on, on the... Uh, I still superb. can't believe that. 
That same day, the news dropped in Australia. My friend Gary, core part of our circle, called me and said, have you read The Age this morning? Picked it up and uh, there was a picture of your dad on the front page. And I thought, my God, what's that? When I saw... There was what was the phone, photo? Part of him and me and saying our own Ronald Biggs and then saying the Brazilian Elizabeth with Ralph O'Brien. Oh, my God. Ronnie Biggs was an infamous train robber from the UK. He escaped to Rio de Janeiro, where he lived as a fugitive for 36 years. There was a thin article and it told the story of him having done a runner and leaving this catastrophe of financial disaster behind. To say that I was shocked, you know, is an understatement. Yeah, it was a, it was a horrific thing. Mm-hmm. So you hadn't spoken to Not any of us Not this whole time? Not at all. The papers related Ronnie Biggs and my father for the similarities in their stories. They both had been accused of stealing millions of dollars. Both were fugitives and both had pregnant Brazilian partners. The last point is important because at the time, under Brazilian law, the parent of a Brazilian child could not be extradited. Due to my mother being pregnant, my father was effectively safe. I wonder if my father knew who Ronnie Biggs was when he met my mum. All the while, he told mum he was innocent. I believed him. I didn't have any reason to not believe him. It was my husband. Yeah. I was married. I had already a child with him. I was having a second child. I had no reason to not believe him. Mum was a trusting and loyal partner to my dad. She'd married him for better or for worse. She was prepared to brave the storm with him. The press in Brazil was looking for him everywhere, so we couldn't go out much. So we were like prisoners and my family was suffering with that too because they were being contacted and everything, my mom and even cousins and all of that. The newspaper articles made it seem like my mom was involved. I would say pretty well everyone had said, well, stuff that for a lark. Um, we're not having anything to do with Ralph or the family. Was it easy for them to think that my mom was a part of it? Yeah, yeah, but certainly that was discussed. Um, and it was more along the lines of, well, you know, Beth must have known. Must have known. How could you not know? We'd gone to Brazil to start our new life. Two months later, we returned to Australia. Dad needed to sort out the mess. He told my mum to stay in Brazil, but she insisted otherwise. We were all going back. He'd have his family behind him. If my father returned to Melbourne, he would be reported to authorities straight away. Too many people knew of him and his alleged crimes there. Instead, we flew directly to Perth. It was March 1994. It was the perfect place for my parents to reinvent their lives. The authorities hadn't yet tracked Dad down and him and Mum had a series of traveller's checks that would last them some time. They rented a property for us to live in and enrolled the boys in school. For my elder brothers, Gabrielle and Heredier, Perth marked the severing of ties between them and their biological fathers and the fastening of Ralph's assumed role as their father. I didn't see my dad at all and it was almost taboo for me to speak about him. And when I did, it was met with hostility. This is Heredier. He's my brother from my mum's relationship that brought her to Australia. He's Congolese Brazilian. Since mum was carrying the trauma of being a victim of domestic violence, it blocked all communication with Heredia's biological father, and it silenced his curiosity about his heritage. I always thought about him. I always knew the fact that I was African. I didn't know I didn't know where in Africa. I didn't know a whole range of things in relation to that part of my life, this is what happens when you lose a knowledge of self, is that you allow other people to define who you are. I didn't keep contact with my dad 
it was almost like it was erased a little bit from my memory and my connection to him in, in Brazil. Gabrielle is my mother's first child, Brazilian born in 1984. I didn't know as I grew older that there was, he was there and I had a, an older sister. By that stage, I was like I didn't want to reconnect because I thought that we had a family here and that was my loyalty lay here. So it was really about making a new life here and, and that included, you know, Ralph and calling him dad. And so I totally forgot, like just blocked out that whole side of my, my other family or my, my dad's side of the family. And yeah, just that, that was it. I think generally as well as a person, like even though we're kids, I'm, I'm generally a lot more open and connecting with people is, I consider, one of my strengths. So, yeah, I think I allowed that to happen with, with Ralph a lot more. I kind of looked up to him and, in a way. Pre-primary, I was Gabriel Desabellis and then I think in year one I was Gabriel O'Brien. So that just became my name and then, yeah, legally, I think it might have been changed like I said when I was 10, 11 or 12 around there. Well, it was a lot easier for Gabrielle to assimilate into white Australian culture than it was for me. I couldn't assimilate. The system is designed for me not to assimilate. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I was to assimilate, in some aspects, it was at the expense of my humanity. Heredia's heritage and therefore skin colour separated him from our family. I always saw, saw myself as an observer of the family. I was part of it, but I was never really a part of it. And so there were elements of the family dynamic, the silence around the history, particularly the lack of explanation for why I was different racially to the rest of the family. That was something that made me see through the facade that the family had created of being this perfect family. I couldn't go along with that illusion. Even though I would call him dad and even though there were times when he would say that he was proud of me as his son. It, it lacked what I, my perception of what a father is. You know, mm-hmm. it lacked that. There was always that distance. Like, he's this white man and here I am, this little African boy. Even from a young age, Heredia could sense he was being assimilated into a white culture. I've heard the phrase, assimilation is genocide in slow motion. The name Editia Lumumba began to get changed around about that time when I was in Perth and people found it difficult to say Editia. Editia starts with H and Harry was a name that people use. And so Editia turned into Harry. Uh, When I was about nine, the name Lumumba was changed to O'Brien. It went from Editia Luzavi Dezabelis Lumumba to Harry, Ralph, Desabelle is O'Brien. So it's just a complete severing of my identity. Your name is a symbol and symbols affect your subconscious mind. And so whenever I would say, just on a subconscious level, writing my name, Harry O'Brien, was activating the, the colonization. Where does that name come from? And it comes from the oppression of, of, of whiteness and the power that whiteness has to whitewash. My brothers, Gabrielle Desabels and Heritia Lumumba, became O'Briens. In May 1994, Matthew, my younger brother, was born. Dad wasn't working. We were still relying on the money he had left in traveller's checks. When all the funds had been exhausted, Dad applied for Social Security. And this alerted authorities to his whereabouts. The police came to our house after that. So it's just a matter of time, really. So they came and took him. He was arrested, released on bail and awaiting his trial. During this time, Dad managed to get a job as a legal consultant for a small business owner. He worked tirelessly and by 1997, he purchased our family home tucked away in a cul-de-sac of a sleepy suburb called Bull Creek, a 40-minute drive from the city. It was a place where everyone kept to themselves, us included. Well, no, we were just that typical suburban family. This is my younger brother, Matt. With a dog, with a couple cars, with a decent house with a swimming pool. And, you know, do you remember the, like, big fucking attraction when you came into our house in the games room. Do you remember all our trophies and medals? Of course. It was like a trophy room. It was like, look at how much we've done. 
It would be like, this is my section, all my medals come up to here, this is gay rav, blah, 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 blah. The people would be like, genuinely interested, people would grab a trophy, be like, oh, where'd you get this? You know, so it was definitely in people's faces that we were this like successful family. Things were going well. We'd been in Perth for three years and were settling into our new life. Here they come in now, all together. From Mommy and Daddy for all of you. Happy Christmas! Then, one night after dinner, I answered to a knock on the door. I was four. Mum was behind me. I stood, staring at two strangers who were after my dad. He kissed me on the forehead and said he'd see me tomorrow. They escorted him to their parked car in our driveway. The next time I saw him, he was in jail. His lawyer rang me to tell me that he had got four years sentence and I was completely devastated. Up until that point, mum had been in utter denial about it all. My dad was convicted of embezzling millions of dollars from the trust accounts of his clients. He had been conducting shady business at his law firm. He was sentenced to four years in a Melbourne jail. The sentence was later reduced to 18 months. Dad was granted a transfer to serve the rest of his time in Perth, closer to us. It was quite an experience going through the jail process, but at the same time I said, well, he's still him, you know, he's the father of my children, I'll just go and give my support. I mean, I really felt terribly for your mother uh, because I could see how appalling this whole thing was for her. Would she ever be open about complaining about that? No way, no way, no way at all. Your mother would never... Your mother wouldn't complain. She was so stoic in defence of the family. She really was. Look, I think as well, I would say she probably was in some denial about what was happening with Ralph. Well, I think everyone, you were all in denial, I would think. All I knew was that he was my dad, he loved me, and I missed him. Even though we were all seemingly grappling with the same circumstances, for Haritia, this time was an entirely different experience. That was my favourite time of my childhood. I would say it was when, when he was in prison. I had so much fun. Like I had so much fun in the family dynamic that we had. I felt like we were family then, properly, because I would help mum, like I would, I would help cook, I would help clean. I would help look after you guys, you know. That that was the freest I had in my childhood was when he was gone. With Ralph temporarily gone from his life, Heredia began to explore his identity. The thing that anyone can do, especially people that come from a lineage of colonisation or their ancestors were enslaved in some way, is the most empowering thing that that they can do or or we can do is is have a knowledge of self, have a knowledge of history, have a knowledge of, of your ancestors. So straight away, I I looked at Malcolm X and I knew who Malcolm X was. That was a symbol for me. I guess what I was always yearning for was an example of of a black role model for me to define my manhood on. So that sort of sent me off on a journey. I became obsessed with the American Civil Rights Movement. I became obsessed with anything really about black men, essentially, because there wasn't black women that I was looking, looking at at that age. It was I was inspired by examples of black men who would who would stand up for not only themselves but for others. Because to me that was the example of manhood that I was missing in my life. And so I, I looked at them as fathers. And I also I was beginning to forge my own identity. But when he got out of prison, like the whole dynamic shifted. You know uh, you know in September 1999, Dad returned home, a free man. There were certain things that were completely different. I saw him sometimes a lot of anger towards Gabriel or towards H.E.A. Not much with you because you were young, but I think it was exacerbated after he came out from jail. I tried to balance his behavior with caring for the family and being, you know, a good mother and good wife, so... I tried to do my side in that sense. 
he came back, and I don't remember much. Like, it just almost like it just went back to like how it was. Like, everything just felt back into place and we went about our daily lives. Like, I didn't think there was like a really big transition period or anything. I think we underestimated how much mum kept everything together while my dad was in jail. She made sure there was nothing that we missed out on. She was the captain of our ship. Yet when he returned, mum handed the reins back to dad. I felt because he was in jail that if he didn't have that position, he would feel inferior or humiliated. So I let him take control of the family, make decisions and all of that. He actually felt more comfortable being in control, being the patriarch, I suppose. I start living for the family, really, so I put all my things aside and I completely, you know, lost part of me, everything, really. My father wedged a gap between us and mum, almost in an attempt to make up for the time he'd lost whilst he was in prison. I guess around that time as well, like I said, 15, 16, he was my coach, so I had a lot to do with him. Yes. You know? Yes. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of, like, any arguments would be, oh, mum, this, or, you know, she did this, or... And I used to always, like, think, yeah, what a, what a crazy bitch she is, you know? And, like, like I love mum. And that was what I used to think at the time because that's what he used to tell me. You know, there's always two sides to a story, but I was only ever... Exposed to his side. Because, you know, mum would just never do that. Like, he would always be speaking ill of mum. And I, and I was like, why? Like, why, why? She's not a bad person, you know what I mean? Like, she's, she's, she's beautiful. Like, there's, there's nothing wrong with her. Mum used to sometimes go and do it. She, would, she used to study Japanese or she would do yeah. IT course. And they were, like, my most feared times. Like, that was so scary for me when she would leave the house, you know, because I was not, he would then attack me. You know, I used to sometimes go and sit under my desk and just cry by myself, you know, because I felt so much hatred towards me when she was gone. I used to hate that. As I got a little bit older, my safe haven was football. Like, whenever he was in the house, I would go to the park, you know, kick just ball. kick the ball, pretend I was playing on MCG or Subiaco Oval because it was safe for me to be out there. Dad was domineering. He put pressure on us all to succeed. Our family became the vessel by which he could redeem himself. Here's Matt. In terms of Ralph, he was um, living through me a little bit. Through, so there was because he wanted to achieve things in football that he never achieved. And he saw that I had a lot of skill, not even skill, more so athleticism, and that he could kind of inflate his sense of self-worth to a degree by the fact that he had successful a successful child. Like, I think part of him was, like, quite stoked in having a kid that was good at sport. You know, it was kind of like... And accepted and... Yeah, yeah, totally. Like, I don't know, I think there were certain things that maybe he didn't achieve in his life that he saw that I could. But despite grooming Matt to become the AFL star he wanted... It was Harit here who truly excelled in football. I often question what my motivation was to play football. And I, the reason why I played so well and I tried so hard was, that, was because that was the only way I could feel like I, I had something like fatherhood. It felt like there was, it was a proud father because it was implicitly suggested that I wasn't okay in the family because of the actions in the silence. It was like your blackness or this, this African part of you, this Congolese part of you isn't okay. So was, that's why we don't talk about it. It's taboo. So I, was, I internalized being taboo. But then on the football field, I could shine. That was, didn't seem to be as apparent and it was something he was proud of me for. And so because that was when I could feel that sense of pride and, and the sense that I was, that race had not completely evaporated, but it had less consequences on the, the sporting field. Football was Heredia's path to acceptance, not only for my dad, but for the broader white Australian community as well. Heredia got his break in 2004. He was picked 21 in the AFL rookie draft by Collingwood Football Club. 
Dad and Heredia bonded like never before. Football was always the place that we could meet and connect. When I got put on the rookie list, you know, he was very encouraging of that. He was really driving that. He was proud as everything when I played my first game. And in fact, my relationship with him improved because I wasn't in his proximity. And the only times he would talk, he would be proud because he'd, he'd want to get the inside word. And so again, that was reaffirming to my humanity. It made me feel human. Now he gives it to O'Brien, who has a bounce. The chase provided by Ballantyne, but Harry's got a bit of toe. Kicks it towards the goal square. Oh, he's kicked a remarkable goal. One of the goals of the year. Harry O'Brien. He went on to have an esteemed AFL career, playing 223 professional games. We were all so proud. He was our success story. Yeah, and, and also it activates the, the whole white saviour complex as well. Look, you know, this is, my, this is my boy and you know what I mean? It's the summer of 2006. My older brother Heredia had been gone for over a year. The house felt empty. I missed him. But mum had good news. Our cousin from Brazil was on his way to live with us for a while. It would be the first of mum's family that we'd meet. And he was a professional hip-hop dancer. I couldn't contain my excitement. I was sure it was going to be the best summer yet. Next time on Silent Waves. I never thought of anything apart from trust him. We absolutely trust him. I found him very creepy. He was always very interested in Raquel, staring at her and very controlling and possessive over her. Like a webcam shot of looking straight ahead at a bed in a really barren room. And I was like, oh, what the fuck is this shit? And it's often been seen as sacrosanct, you know, what happens within the family and family secrets belong to the family. If you've been enjoying listening to Silent Waves, please subscribe, rate, and leave us a review to help spread the message. Silent Waves is created and produced by Raquel O'Brien and me, Georgina Savage, in partnership with Neely Media. The show is hosted by Raquel, and I'm the editor. Music production by I Am XO of Alt Music Group, with audio assistance by Lloyd Richards and Charlie Vonox. Our graphic design is by Stacey Gugulis. <laughs>